That's right. This is the Sportsman's Voice Podcast. I am your host, Fred Bird. Thanks so much for tuning in. Before we get to this week's guest, let us check in on the stories happening across the nation with this week's TSV Roundup. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome into another weekly edition of the Sportsman's Voice Roundup for the week of March 25th, where we take you coast to coast and down to the hill for the latest and greatest across the country in sportsmen legislation. This week, we go to the hill to talk rigs to reef. Oklahoma passes licenses to overhaul legislation, a top priority for CSF and partners. Idaho flexes its muscle on muscles. A river does not run through it in Georgia, where stream access for hunters and anglers has been restricted. All of that coming at you, but first, we're going to the first state. Delaware has gone to the birds. Hallelujah, we got some good news to bring to you with my colleague, Kaylee Leaguer, out of the Mid-Atlantic State Senior Coordinator, brings you good news in Delaware. Kaylee, welcome to the program. Lay it on us. All right, Fred. Well, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here today to talk about some of the good things happening in Delaware. So this week on the TSV, you might have saw that Delaware finally um, has made some progress on House Bill 271. Um, that basically is removing this long, long-standing prohibition on uh, Sunday game bird hunting. Um, HB 271 removes that prohibition by allowing the Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Control, um, its Division of Fish and Wildlife, to uh, set Sunday hunting for game birds, which includes turkeys, uh, upland birds, waterfowl, um, and anything that is defined so in the state as a game bird. And um, it passed both chambers unanimously, and it is awaiting Governor Cardney's signature for enactment. So we are holding tight on that, looking forward to the progress uh, moving that forward and working with DENREC um, to implement it in the first state. Well, that's fantastic news. That's really great. It's great to see the unanimous uh, bicameral bipartisan support on that legislation in Delaware. Um and now, now it awaits uh, Governor Carney's signature. Uh, Governor Carney is a member of our Governor Sportsman's Caucus and has a, a, a standing history and, and of good, good policy being signed by his hand for sportsmen and women of Delaware. So we're eagerly and anxiously looking forward to uh, all of that, uh, getting a bow on it in the form of, of the governor's signature and uh, adding to, to his legacy of, of pro sportsmen and women uh, legislation being enacted in the first state. So once Governor Carney uh, does put his signature on this legislation, it becomes law. When does it take effect and uh, who would be uh, able to enjoy the win here in, in any hunting season in 2024? Yeah, Fred. So um, the bill would take effect in July. And so that would be too late for the 2024 turkey season in Delaware. However, it would possibly be able to work for the upcoming 2024-2025 waterfowl season. Uh, in the first state. Uh, if the bill is signed or once the bill is signed and enacted, um, it's then up to the secretary of the Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Control. And I'll use DENREC because that's what the uh, abbreviation is, is called. Um, so once that's signed, DENREC then has to let U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service know that uh, they are now a Sunday hunting state. Um, and that's going to dictate some of the uh, structure of their season for waterfowl season coming up. Mm -hmm. um, and so once that's done, it could possibly be enacted for this upcoming uh, duck and goose season um, in the first state. And also, Delaware does have a, t a tundra swan season, um, a, a lottery system for that. So um, I believe that that would also take take precedence with that. Um, so once that's done, they have to just, again, let U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service know, and it could potentially be enacted for this upcoming uh, waterfowl season at the end of this year. Well, certainly we look forward to uh, any developments there, and then we will update this audience once uh, once the next step has been taken and what, what the forecast looks, for, um, looks like for uh, this fall season upcoming. Um, you know, that's that's a great win for, for your working class, but for all sportsmen and women uh, in Delaware. I know you referenced, you know, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service would have to adjust some of those waterfowl seasons. Some people may think, oh, we're losing days, but in fact, you're not. Um, this is still the prescribed number of days. 
It's just now there's going to be more access for more people. So, you know, uh, people that are working their 60 hours a week just to keep up with the times and maybe even more, thank you, inflation, you know, trying to get out there for one day Saturday, maybe you can't even get out there because your kids are involved in extracurriculars or you're working overtime just to keep up with uh, where we're at in the economy of this this great country. So, you know, leave, leaves very little time for leisure. Uh, and when you cut half of most of that access off in a handful of these states that still have some sort of Sunday hunting pro prohibition, that is certainly troublesome. And, and, you know, if I'm spending my money on a hunting license or, you know, in, in one of these states, I want the fullness, uh, the full potential of, of, of my day as a field. And, you know, again, uh, great, great work, uh, on your account, great work, uh, partnering with our in-state partners and, and working directly uh, with our our legislative caucus there in Delaware, uh, who engaged on this early and enthusiastically and, and, and moved the needle here. And again, wow, another testament to the power of CSF, our relationships, uh, not only at the federal level, but definitely at the state level, where a lot of a lot of the rulemaking and laws affect um, all of our all of our sportsmen and women in our community. Um, that's where stuff's getting done. So, uh, well done to you. Well done for, uh, the engagement and working hand in hand with our, uh, Delaware legislative sportsman's caucus. It's fantastic. Yeah. Thanks Fred. I think it's important to note too, that there's still eight States remaining, um, with the, the game bird hunting prohibition on Sundays. Once this is enacted, there will only be seven left as Delaware will be removed from that list. And as you mentioned previously, uh, Governor Carney has a history of, you know, pro sportsmen and women's legislation. For example, back in 2016, uh, signing the authority for uh, hunting on both private and public lands for deer hunting on five Sundays during the firearm seasons. And then again in 2018, um, there was an opportunity for states, or even for, excuse me, for hunting on every Sunday throughout the state's archery and firearm deer season. So, uh, with the enactment of this third bill here, it'll it'll definitely add to Governor Carney's continuous support of sportsmen and women in the first state. And as you had mentioned, he sits on the Governor Sportsman's Caucus. So he's definitely a champion. He's a hunter. Uh, we look forward to having his support in the enactment of this bill and all the good things to come in the first state. So I appreciate you recognizing it. And uh, I look forward to myself going over and uh, duck hunting on Sundays in Delaware. No doubt. And for the aspiring, uh, traveling turkey hunter, because if you're going to try to hit your 49 states, that got to have you got to hit hit Delaware. Uh, Delaware is a little unique. Um, there's some things you want to pay attention to as you're making your spring uh, 2025 plans. If you're going to head to the first state, do a mid Atlantic tour, if you will. Uh, Delaware has some um, some land. Well, there's a lottery, right? I, if you're going to hunt in public, there's there's there is some sort of lottery there. If you know someone on private, uh, better for you. Uh, and then Delaware also requires a, uh, a turkey specific uh, education course. I think most of that can be facilitated online. Um, so just a couple G gee whiz thoughts about turkey hunting Delaware. I, Kaylee um, will attest that it's far easier uh, under and, and, and other waterfowl uh, hunting. Just, just go over there and do that. Um, with the exception of tundra, it's one that's a, that's another lottery there. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. So if you're going to turkey hunt, it's a mandatory class. Uh, I believe that they, they do offer it online. I think it's about $30 and you have to do it beforehand. You watch the video. Um, it's a little bit of educational information. And once you do that, you're good to go. Um, but as you mentioned, it is a lottery system. And they I believe they start doing that around the January time frame is when it's due. Um, and there's some lands that are managed by the Division of Fish and Wildlife and also um, by the Division of Forestry. Um, so there's some options there. And again, it is lottery based. That's fairly competitive. Uh, quite a few people apply for it, but they do their best to make sure that everybody gets uh, gets an opportunity. Um, so if you're interested in that, make sure you call and find out exactly what you need to do and the licenses you need to have. Um, but, you know, there's some pretty good opportunity if you're fortunate enough to pull, uh, pull lottery tag. So uh, Maryland is you don't have to do that. You can come over and, you know, obviously the Eastern Shore and and Delaware are, are very close knit. So one day you can go to Delaware on a Sunday and then the Monday or that Saturday you can come over to Maryland. So it's uh making good progress here in the mid Atlantic region. 
Well, fantastic. Great work again. Thanks so much for joining us uh, for this week uh, with this great news and continued success with your uh, your contacts in your region. And we're looking forward to hearing from you again real soon. All right. Thanks, Fred. I appreciate it. You bet. Thanks again to Kaylee for joining us and uh, highlighting that, again, that great win there in Delaware. Um, definitely looking forward to the finale, the finalizing uh, of that. And Delaware sportsmen and women enjoying uh, an extra day uh, to pursue what they want to. So good stuff there. Let's, uh, let's turn to the other headlines of this week. We'll start on the Hill. Congressional Sportsman Foundation Chris Horton testifies on rigs to refill in the house. Uh, you guys may remember we had Chris and uh, from American Sport Fishing Association, ASA, Mike Leonard on during our NAS Summit Sound. We specifically talked about rigs to reef and kind of deep dove that a little bit. And um, Mr. Horton was able to, uh, as our senior director of fisheries policy, was able to go uh, to the House and testify in the House Natural Resources Subcommittee on Water, Wildlife, and Fisheries on the Marine Fisheries Habitat Protection Act, H.R. 6814. Um, the article goes in kind of given a history and the benefits of it. And if you remember back to that episode, you know, the, the crux of this is you have all these platforms out there uh, in the Gulf area that what what was once um, kind of a, a an aquatic desert where there's nothing really going on, uh, life has bloomed uh, in these, you know, these artificial reefs that have established themselves on these rigs. So. You know, they, they go through a decommissioning process and, you know, some, some people want them removed completely. Um, and, and in doing so, you, you completely remove these ecosystems, these beautiful ecosystems that have been set up um, because of, because of the, uh, the oil rigs that, are, that have been put out there. And, uh, you know, there's, there's so much value uh, to leaving them, you know, once they're decommissioned and, and getting them. Um, in the place where, where they're no longer producing, but all, they are producing wildlife and wildlife habitat. And then that creates, you know, that's, there's a whole other uh, angling issue to that and, and, and industry. And, uh, you know, it's just a, it just doesn't make any sense to remove all this, this, this beauty that's tied into these, these artificially um, made structures. But the, what a, what a what a great silver lining to that, right? So th this is the focus uh, of this and, and Chris's work and and trying to tell that story and you know keep keep what's already there and uh, and not return that region to to an aquatic desert, right? Um, interesting fact: since the late '40s, nearly seven thousand offshore oil and gas platforms were installed in the Gulf of Mexico providing otherwise scarce hard substrates that become the catalyst for thriving marine ecosystems and important fishing and diving destinations. We had literally just said that, right? But, you know, going back almost, gee whiz, 2024, I mean, you're getting up to almost 100 years. These, these structures have been out there and, and, and just breeding life and habitat. So more to come on this as we're able to, to move through it. The Marine Fisheries Habitat Protection Act effectively provi provides a pathway for saving more of these important artificial habitats for future generations. And obviously, we at CSF look forward uh, to working with our CSC members and, and getting that um, put into law and make sure these, these vital ecosystems stay in place. So more to come on that story. As we head over to Oklahoma, um, our own Ken Keen brings us uh, some updates on license overhaul legislation. Uh, that is top priority for CSF and partners. Um, so in short, the Sooner State uh, is going to simplify their, their licensing as well as see a much needed increase in, in, um, in costs for those, right? Uh, over two decades, Oklahoma has not raised the price and some people, you know, will hear this like, oh, who wants the who wants to raise the price for hunting and fishing? It's already, you know, it's already expensive enough. Well, you know, this uh 
this all this all costs and needs resources. And you know, uh, kind of referenced it earlier, uh, our economic uh, situation that we find ourselves in in 2024, and pretty much everything has doubled. Uh, what hasn't in recent years in most states is licensing fees. And, you know, I know some people have heartburn with, with paying more, but we only get to appreciate the resource and the pursuit, uh, and, and putting conservation dollars to work on the landscape to continue those conservation missions, uh, by way of those license sales and then matched up with the, the national funding through PR and, and Dingle Johnson. So. After several years of advocacy and many iterations, Oklahoma will finally see its hunting and fishing license system overhauled and simplified following the passage of Senate Bill 941. So uh, widely supported by the conservation and sporting community, also provides the state's first license increase, what we just said, uh, after more than 20 years. And um, following its successful concurrence vote, the, uh, the Senate on March 19th, SB 9, uh, 941 now goes to uh, the governor's desk, who is a uh, Governor Sportsman's Caucus member, uh, Kevin Siddit, for his signature. So, again, what may sound like a, a loss <laughs> immediately for the individual, this is really a great, a great gain here and, and much-needed resources to continue those missions to continue to add to um, what, what, you know, what we all love. This is a support system for that. Otherwise, um, you know, how, how does it happen? Who pays for it? Who funds it? And where do we go from there? If not, so uh, do celebrate it. There, there is a, a large, large silver lining to those increases. And, uh, you know, as, as the article highlights, it is supported uh, by the sporting community there in Oklahoma. So hope, Hope to hear and see good things about that, and that is embraced. Let's uh, head over to Idaho. Idaho is going to flex their muscle against muscles. So, Idaho's fight against Guaga muscles receives additional funding and some angling access restored. So, here we go. A uh, case of invasive aquatic species. Uh, Quagga mussels initially detected in the Snake River in September of 2023. Uh, these, these mussels uh, cause and wreak havoc once established. They're fast produ reproducers, clogging agricultural uh, piping, more more pipes for um, fresh water to keep, keep flowing. And uh, so couple things at play as that happens water becomes stagnant that uh, creates um a stagnant set of water i guess or water body so that the, the life that is in there uh, ceases to exist it makes it makes it junk it's just it's a puddle at that point and then additionally the the infrastructure that's in place that these muscles affect has cost the state millions of dollars uh to to remove to fix so um huge problem there you know and and over here in the east and i think the great lakes you got zebra mussels and you know, i've heard about them since i was a kid and you wonder what could a little mollusk possibly do and then they just again they just wreak havoc just terrible um infestation of them and just ruins so much so in idaho the legislation, the legislator provided $6.6 million in funding for detection and treatment of the mussels in Senate Bill 1372, which was signed into law by uh, Governor Sportsman's Caucus member, Governor Brad Little, uh, here just last week, March 20th. So, uh, good deal there. Uh, another win to report. The governor is quoted in the article, an unchecked spread of quagga mussels has the potential to cost Idaho hundreds of millions of dollars in direct and indirect costs. The Idaho Works Bill, he signed 
increases the manpower and resources to keep invasive species out of the precious water systems of Idaho. So there you have it. Finally, let's head down to Georgia, where CSF has opposed legislation that would restrict stream access for Georgia hunters and anglers. Brought to you by our friend Connor Barker, whom you guys heard from last week. In 2023, another Governor Sportsman's Caucus member, Governor Brian Kemp, signed Senate Bill 115 in the law, which ensured that Georgia sportsmen and women can access navigable streams in the state. Fast forward to this year, House Bill 1172 is currently working its way through the Georgia General Assembly despite concerns from the sporting community about its negative impacts on access. It would undercut the legislation enacted last year and prohibit sportsmen and women from pursuing their uh, quarry in traditional manners. 1172 would limit access to hunters and anglers on the navigable streams, and specifically the bill creates ambiguity regarding access to stream bottoms as the low water mark. It's difficult to define that. While some waters allow for access to hunt and fish exclusively by boat or paddlecraft, it would be nearly impossible to hunt or fish without accessing the stream bed in many instances. This means duck hunters would no longer be able to touch the stream bottom while setting decoys, and wade shoal bass fishermen would have difficulty accessing their favorite holes without breaking the law. There was Senate Bill 542 that offered clarification on the issue by ex explicitly allowing access to stream beds when actively hunting or fishing, but that failed to pass in the House Judiciary Committee uh, last week from this, uh, this podcast drop. So you're creating an issue with access, which is often cited as a barrier for entry uh, amongst the sporting community. and um, we hope the legislation will, will die, uh, but we'll continue to work with our partners in the Georgia Legis Legislative Sportsman's Caucus to enjoy, ensure hunting and fishing tradition are continue to be enjoyed and the access remains for Georgian sportsmen and women. So there you have it for the week of March 25th. Happy to report. More good news than bad. Certainly uh, in 2024, we have seen an uptick in, in anti-sportsman legislation. So uh, as always, and weekly, we'll keep you updated where we're at on that. As always, we encourage you to subscribe to the Sportsman's Voice EPUB by going to congressionalsportsman.org. You can go there, sign up, get that weekly, uh, as well as subscribing to this particular program. Get the updates in an audio version and more of a deep dive every single Wednesday. We're coming at you to follow by a bi-weekly feature show on the every other Thursday drops. Uh, this particular week is one of those weeks, and we bring to you this Thursday, uh, and that's tomorrow from this drop, uh, sound from the very bit of last sound from NASC. And uh, turkey season is here and in so many of the southern states. We're going to celebrate that. I'm going to bring you a conversation I had with my, my dear friends, uh, Doug Little, Jerry McCutcheon uh, from Nashua Turkey Federation, and round the episode out with co-CEO Jason Burkhalter, uh, all-around good guy, and uh, I think he's already enjoyed a little success in the turkey season. So, uh, as always, I enjoy talking turkey. I hope you enjoy the content forthcoming, and uh, you can tune in to that episode uh, this Thursday following the publication of this weekly offering. It is Easter week, so for those of you that celebrate uh, Holiest of Holy Weeks, have a, have a wonderful Holy Week, and, uh, you know, in uh, celebrating at the end of Holy Week with your family and, and whatever that in, in, entails for you. But, um, yeah, wishing you the best uh, this Easter week. And uh, after that, we get into April, and God willing... <laughs> We start to see some some buds bloom and the temperature, uh, the mercury rise a bit. I know here in the Northeast we were well on our way, and uh, this past this past weekend we got walloped with a 
kind of a storm that came out of nowhere. Everything's white and icy and cold again. And all the critters, to include the, the blooming crocuses and tulips, are very confused <laughs> and would like to get on with their spring. So if you're enjoying some heat and green stuff happening where you are, good for you. Send it up my way. Send it up to the Northwest. We sure would uh, appreciate it. That is it for this week. Thanks so much for bringing us along in your day. And uh, wherever you're going, be safe. And we will see you again next week. Thanks so much for tuning in. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us on this edition of the Sportsman's Voice podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, your support is crucial, and you can help us out right now by leaving a review, filling in those five stars where available, sharing this episode with friends and family, and engaging with us socially. CSF can be found on Facebook, Instagram, and X, formerly known as Twitter. Together, we can protect the outdoor sports we love and continue to keep you informed wherever you are. That's it for this week. Until next time, we'll see you later.